Hello. Thank you for joining Liberating the Queen, a podcast where we discuss amazing women in history. Well, amazing women that weren't in my history books. My goal for 2018 is to share what I've learned with all of you the 15th of every month. I am Susie Mosco, and today is April 15th, 2018, Tax Day. This episode is brought to you by Peppermint Bay by Layla. Get all of your bath bomb and lip balm needs on Etsy when you search for Peppermint Bay. We actually have a special guest host today, the owner and operator of Peppermint Bay and my daughter, Layla Mosco. Hello, everyone. I am happy to be here today. <laughs> today, we are going to talk about not one not two, but three amazing women who dared to make their mark in history and travel the world. Spring is in the air, and in Minnesota, everybody is ready to bust out of their house. This is a nod to our first episode where we learned about Jean Bure, who circumvented the globe. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on three different ladies. The first one, Nellie Bly. Second one, Annie Londonberry. And third, Isabella Lucy Bird. All three women were born around the mid-1800s, were nonconformists and didn't pull any punches. They were ambitious, modern thinkers in a time when women were supposed to be timid and, more important, obedient. Get settled in for the first time ever. We're going to have a new format with three amazing travelers and a special guest host. Join Layla and myself for a trip around the world. For our first segment, we will be talking about Annie Londonberry. Annie Londonberry became famous as the first woman to bicycle around the world. She was born Annie Cohen Kopchowski in Regla, Latavia, 1870. Her family set sail for America and a new life when Annie was just a child. I couldn't find much about her childhood. Earliest accounts I read about were that she was married and had three kids by 1892. That would make her 22. In parallel, during that time, it is said that a group of men made a bet with one another that no woman could beat the record for cycling around the world. A man named Thomas Stevens had set the record 10 years earlier. Now, as the story goes, this bet for a woman came with some caveats. She had to do it in 15 months. Stevenson took about 32 months, starting with zero cash, and earned $5,000. There was speculation that any woman to attempt this challenge was to win $10,000 if she succeeded. Annie had never been on a bike before, but having three children myself, I can definitely take a guess at what some of her motivation may have been to take on this feat. Layla, how old were you when you first rode a bike? About six years old. That feels pretty young, right? If you took on a trip around the world... How long would you want to practice for? 20 years. About 20 years, you feel like, and then you'd be able to do that? And how old are you right now? Nine. So at 29, you'll do this, right? No. (laughs) It was June 25th, 1894. Annie went in the front of a crowd and was ready to set off around the world. She just learned how to ride a bike only two days before she left. That's a pretty big deal, right? Yeah. Right. Humongous. Humongous. I would never do that in my whole life. Right. (laughs) In today's world, a woman leaving her husband and children to fend for themselves and uh, take off for a bike around the world would be scandalous in itself. But in 1894, it was a pretty radical feat. Although, at that time, most assumed she wouldn't make it more than a couple of days. Now, Layla, when I, like, go on a business trip and leave you with Daddy, how do you feel? Sometimes I'm okay. Sometimes I'm not. But I feel like you're just going to fly around the world forever. You feel like I'm going to fly around the world forever? For, like, 84 days. What if I decided to take a bike ride around the world? Would you come with me? I would sneak into the suitcase. Okay. (laughs) And then I would come with you and I would eat all your food. That's not very polite. I don't care. (laughs) Before she left, she needed some money. Annie talked to water company Londonberry. 
they gave her $100 to put a sign on her bike. During the bike ride, other people put their names on her clothes so she would earn money to keep biking and people would buy her products. I would have liked to put Peppermint Bay sign on her. I would love to do that. <laughs> I want to put one right now. Where is she right now? Yeah, she's not alive anymore. Um, But I think that's a really good thought. Now, the first part of Annie's journey considered of cycling across the United States and provided to be more of a challenge than she had expected. In fact, she came very close to giving up when she reached Chicago. Her woman's bicycle was heavy and cycling in a full skirted heavy woman's dress of the time was restrictive and exhausting. This part of the journey, Annie made two big changes towards accomplishing this task. Number one, losing the skirt and replacing it with a lighter set of bloomers. Number two, she ditched the woman's bike and went for a considerably lighter men's one. I mean, she was going for equal rights after all. With renewed confidence, she set off again and was on her way to France. Layla, we went to Paris. Could you imagine bicycling through Paris in the 1800s? No, I would just stop everywhere and eat all the macaroons. That's fair. You do like macaroons. Her epic journey continued through France into Egypt, China, and Japan. She would have to collect signatures in each place as proof she went, she was in the area. Annie seems to have loved the limelight and enjoyed spitting fairy tales and sometimes outright lies to the press. At various times, she told them she was a medical student and a law student and told stories about her journey which were full of danger and threat, but most often entirely fabricated. These stories, however, sold and helped people to raise Annie's celebrity status, enabling her to demand greater sums of money from sponsors and fans. There was also a question about how much of her journey was actually on her bicycle, for she certainly completed quite long stretches on boats and trains. However, technically, the bet had not stipulated how many miles she should actually cycle, so she was still within the rules. Doubtless, though, she did do a considerable amount of cycling, even continuing on her bike after an accident where she broke her wrist, and on one occasion when her bike had a puncture, opting to carry the cycle and walk rather than hop on a train. In March 1895, she arrived back in America, landing in San Francisco. She cycled her way from east to west, finally arriving home in Boston on the 24th of September, almost exactly 15 months to the day she had left. The New York world described her epic adventure as the most extraordinary journey ever undertaken by a woman. She was a celebrity and for a while was given her own column in the New York world, where she wrote about her journey with her unusual amount of creative license. She's quoted as saying, quote, I am a journalist and a new woman. End quote. She wrote, quote, if that term means that I believe I can do anything that a man can do, end quote. Layla, what was your favorite part of that story? Well, and it's not really a story. It's part of history. Probably the part where the signatures were happening. And why I like that part so much is because I would never do that walking around with a bunch of pens. With a bunch of pens? Having like, to just collect signatures? Like a bunch of names on my clothes that I don't even know. Right. You would want people that you at least know to be on your clothes. That makes sense. That would be awesome. Would you have Justin Bieber on your clothes? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. I just wanted to make sure. For segment two, we will be talking about Isabel Lucy Bird. Isabella Bird, born 1831 to 1904. She was an adventurer taking cheap transport and facing mobs. Dun, dun, dun! (laughs) 
Now, Isabella Bird isn't your typical adventurer. She was a slightly stout woman. She was middle-aged from Yorkshire, England. She suffered from chronic health issues. Um, Her first sea voyage to the United States, which would inform Bird's first book, published in 1856 in English Women in America, was made at the suggestion of her doctors to help ease her insomnia and depression. She was a truly an amazing woman, says travel photographer, expert, and author Deborah Ireland, who compiled a book on Miss Bird. Quote, she didn't start learning photography until she was 60 years old. She decided to take up a new profession when most people are considering retirement. End quote. The images in the book that we're talking about really show off Bird's technical and um, creative skills, creating really high quality images in the most testing of conditions. In Ireland's book, she explains after the sudden death of Bird's father from influenza in 1858, a huge financial burden was placed on um, the writer and also her unmarried sister, Henrietta saying, quote, it was a financial necessity that started her traveling. At 40, she thought to be unmarriable and went to Australia. We don't know for sure, but maybe it was the thought that she could get lucky there. Maybe she just couldn't handle the heat, um, the drunk men, the flies. And she tells her sister she really just wants to come home, end quote. It was the trip home from Australia, 18... 18- 73, she didn't want to go to Scotland because it was winter. So she she decided to go home to Hawaii. Yay! I think that was a good idea. It was the best idea. Do you world. think it's better to be in winter or better to be in Hawaii? Mm, let me think. It's winter. Let me think. It's winter right now, so I would rather be in winter. Oh, really? So you wouldn't want to go to Hawaii? I would never want to go to Hawaii because it's so far away. That's fair. It is pretty far. So in Hawaii, there are none of the social constraints of colonial rule or Victorian morale correctness. And uh, she observed that people can truly be happy with very little. This is kind of a moment in her life that shook her a bit. Um... She, about six months into palm, the palm groves and the coral reefs and the volcanoes of the Sandwich Islands, um, she was starting to write with a more intimacy and a more informality. Um, and she ended up publishing a book in 1875 about her experience, and the book sold out within 12 months. And this really is where she gains a lot of notoriety and financial independence. Her work often fairly, well, really unfairly dismissed by male contemporaries as frivolous coffee table entertainment. In reality, she ventured into the remotest of locations, took note of the local climate, the fauna, the flora, and the economy, and produced compelling accounts containing a humanitarian type sensitivity and lightness of touch that were unique for the time. Bird really set the tone for contemporary travel writers by demonstrating that the journey itself was the adventure and that ordinary people can often make more engaging subjects than some, you know, brimished copper sunset or snow-capped mountains. Quote, no one has an adventure like Miss Bird, end quote, crowned the Spectator magazine in its review of her next release, A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains, published in 1879. The book was another hit and included a timeless depiction of the charismatic local outlaw, Rocky Mountain Jim, as, and I quote from the book, um, quote, a man any woman would fall in love with, but no sane woman would ever marry, end quote. During that time, no one was really writing like that. So it's it's important to denote just her ability to bring levity to certain situations where um, some judgments may have passed or deemed it to just be a place not to go to or something of a more lower class. It wasn't until she was working um, and had her first visit to Hong Kong and China um, where she kind of hit 
uh, a real personal nerve with Westerners. She had gone from going to these like five star hotels, all of this gilded comfort, and really ditched all that to travel the cheapest way possible and write about it. Um, she was happy to describe the discomfort um, for the entertainment of her readers. In one of the pieces that she wrote, and I quote, the Volga, where the steam train she was traveling on, is a miserable steamer. The ship was damp, dark, dirty, old, and cold, end quote. Um, now, at the time, she was rivaling her competitors who were staying in five-star hotels and having the best of food um, and just completely circumventing this whole other lifestyle that may have been unaffordable to other people. Uh, she was writing about more of the unaffordable experiences, but really providing a genuine and articulate look at it. Now, Layla, when you're traveling, I think we've traveled many times before, and there are times where we stay at really nice places, and there are times when we stay at more affordable places. Would you rather stay at a super nice hotel, or would you rather stay at one of the more affordable hotels? I would stay at a way better hotel that costs like a bazillion, trillion, billion dollars. Would you pay for it with your Peppermint Bay money? Never. Never. That's what I thought. That's what I was worried about. Never. You would pay for everything. You would give me a mini fridge after we come back. And I would have a million stuff that I would like. That you would like? That's very sassy of you. Uh, when I we... When we went to, when we went to Paris, did you enjoy having the um, how many like two macaroons at the top of the Eiffel Tower? Well, kind of like a little bit. I did enjoy. I loved it, but I would wish for more. Yeah, that's fair. But you said I only get two. I did because that's how we roll. In, no, her, in her personal life in 1880, Bird married her sister's doctor, uh, John Bishop. It was his untimely death in March of 1886 that acted as a catalyst for another series of intense adventures to uh, Persia, Kurdistan, and then Korea. In 1894, Bird was suddenly deported from Korea ahead of the outbreak of the Suno Japanese War and ended up back in China with no luggage in a small missionary hospital. And here she's being treated for malaria and a broken arm. Here's an, another way that she kind of realizes just how Westerners are viewing this country as she's surrounded by a lot of Westerners who are being treated for things. And she just kind of realizes how unintentionally insulting and patronizing the attitude of the Westerners really were, she, characterized really by their poor language skills, their offensive, tight-fitting clothes, their ignorance of local customs, and really futile preaching of Christianity to locals who really revered more calligraphy and the printed word over the spoken word. So again, she continues to compile kind of her onset of wanting to explore more of the local customs and be able to expose it to Westerners who are traveling so that they have a, an easier um, and a more relaxed experience. She bought clothes that people in China would wear. She would talk like them, eat like them, and pray with them. She wrote about what life was really like in China. Um, so in another one of her stories, she's uh, quoted as saying, quote, people think it witty to ridicule everything Chinese, poke fun at these junks and their pigtailed, long-coated crews, but their handling of them is masterly, end quote, writes Birds. During this time, uh, Shanghai was extremely hazardous, undertaken initially by riverboat with a team of trackers responsible for hauling, rowing, and dragging the vessels up treacherous rapids and against powerful currents. There is a genuine love and affection that she has for this bravery as they risk their livelihood on their footing of these steep cliffs and their adjacency to the river. Quote, there are rough, truly, 
But as the voyage went on, their honest work, pluck, endurance, hardihood, sobriety, and good-natured won my sympathy in some sort of my admiration, end quote. Bird's ability to capture the experience built on empathy was something that other writers weren't adopting in their articles. Readers weren't getting a different lens on world travel. And with Bird, they were all of a sudden getting this, this whole other view, and people loved it. She didn't play it safe. When traveling through other areas of the world, Bird recorded events of being pelted with mud, attacked by mobs, assaulted with sticks, and trying to sleep in damp, cold accommodations. Eventually, she did carry a revolver, concealed within her many skirts. In her final chapters, she begins to clarify more things. Quote, commercial and industrial energy is not decaying. The vast fleets of junks are not rotting in the harbors and reaches. Thrift, resourceful, and the complete organization both of labor and commerce meets the traveler on every turn, end quote. Bird writes challenging misconceptions that were given at that time. She takes photos of China prospering, the bustling cities, the busy river ports. Bird rejected the notion that China was in dire need of Western intervention, but drew great attention to how some China traditions impacted young girls. She went into greater detail about binding of their feet and their treatment of younger girls instead of focusing on its economy and its need for Western civility. She traveled to North America in her later years, but her poor health finally caught up with her. It is said that when Isabel Lucy Bird died in Edinburgh on October 7, 1904, her camera was in London along with her luggage, packed for one last journey to China. My favorite part of her story was she dressed like the country when she was visiting China. You liked that she dressed like a non-Westerner, like um, she dressed like how they would dress? Yeah. For this third segment, we are going to be talking about American journalist Nellie Bly. She was born Elizabeth Jane Corcoran, and she's arguably today best known for spending 10 days in a madhouse, an early example of an investigation journalism that exposed the cruelties experienced by those living in an insane asylum on uh, New York's Blackwell Island. Bly was a true journalism pioneer, not just for women, but for all reporters. For this podcast, though, we are going to focus on her project that attracted even more attention, a trip around the world by train, steamship, rickshaw, horse, and donkey, all accomplished in 72 days. Bly's goal was to beat the fictional Phineas Fogg 80-day odyssey as written in the 1873 novel by Jules Verne. But her courage and determination helped her circumvent the globe in just 72 days, setting a world record, besting her own goal of 75 days, and, as we go through the story, and unbeknownst to her, beating out a competitor, Elizabeth Byland of Cosmopolitan magazine. Layla, how long do you think it would take for you to go around the globe? How long would it take for you to go around the globe? Like, how many days do you think it would take for you to go around the globe if you were doing it by ship and I by plane, it, by bike? Um, by, what's a bike? A bike? Bicycle? Oh, okay. I thought you said bike. <laughs> um, so, um, I think it would be about 300 days. Yeah, that would probably be accurate for a nine-year-old. Or, like, one year. Or one year. That's about 300 days. Do you think you would... Because you've been kayaking and done all that stuff. Do you think you would kayak any portion of it? I would probably kayak on, like, um, some of the small parts. Not, like, on the ocean. I would take it by, like, plane. And then on an island, I'd drop there. And then I'd take it by boat. Got it. But whenever there's, like, not big, about, like, 
three miles of a lake or something, yeah, I would probably take a kayak. That would be smart. I mean, we're learning about all these women that we know that bicycling you wouldn't want to do and that no, you would want to no, do a nice bicycling. luxurious trip. So it's interesting. Maybe we can plan something out. Nellie's boss did not want her to go. He told her that it would be impossible because she was a girl. She was like, send a boy at the same time and I will beat him. Do you think like it matters if you're a boy or a girl when it comes to going around the world? Yeah, because girls are like the best. That's true. All right. What, uh, moving but along. if a boy is watching this, <laughs> that is totally true. We're both the same. Okay. But if a boy is listening, we're equal. But okay. Got it. Um, what about if your brothers are listening? Okay. We'll just end it right there. Bly planned ahead and packed light. She took along a single piece of luggage, a bag so small, by today's standards, it would be considered a carry-on. She only packed a few changes of underwear, soap, notebooks, PJs, a cup, a couple hats, three veils, a pair of slippers, needle and thread, and some handkerchiefs. She didn't pack a single change of clothes, wearing only the garment she commissioned from a dressmaker made of a plain blue broadcloth and a quiet plaid camel's hair. It was her only concession to vanity. Bly stated, the world's greeting me as I greet it. Bly's record of her trip is as lively as that quip. Her observations made during her travels are astute and frequently humorous. Bly writes, quote, do you get seasick? I asked in an interested, friendly way. That was enough. I flew to the railing. Sick? I looked blindly down, caring little what the wild waves were saying, and gave vent to my feelings. She endured the seasickness and made it to London in seven days. A train then bore her to Paris, where she took a short side trip to uh, meet Jules Verne himself. He wished her luck, saying, If you do it in 79 days, I shall applaud you with both hands. So did you understand, Layla, what she was doing on the ship? She th she was throwing up a lot on the ship. Because she was getting so sick because of all the waves, right? Yeah. Did you ever throw up on your kayak? No, but no. <laughs> I think if I was on a ship, I think it would be like a roller coaster. But you would be okay, right? Yeah, I would be okay, but for like that seven days, that makes sense. Right. Let's see. You can get seasickness. As Bly continued through the continent of Europe and on to Egypt and the Suez Canal, she was completely unaware that she was in a competition with another gal. On the same day she departed to London, um, a woman named Bisland left New York headed in the opposite direction under... Um, she was working for Cosmopolitan magazine, basically. Bisland serves as a good contrast to Bly. Bislin's account of her journey was filled with highly lyrical, impressionistic writing. Sapphires would be the pale and cold beside the sea, um, with waves and shadows deep as violets, not yet purple, uh, with no touch of any color, a perfect hue. Editors began to take bets on the time they would arrive back, really down to the minute. When Bly arrived in Hong Kong on Christmas Day, she reported to the office of the Oriental and Occidental Steamship Company to set up her departure for Japan. There, the man in the office told her she was going to lose the race. And Bly writes, quote, lose it? I don't understand what you mean. Um, she demanded, beginning to think he was mad. Aren't you having a race around the world? He asked, as if he thought she was not Nellie Bly. Yes, quite right. I'm running a race with time, she replied. Time? I don't think that's her name. Her? Her? She repeated, thinking, poor fellow, he's quite unbalanced, and wondering if if she dared to wink at the doctor to suggest maybe he talks to him. Um, and he replied, yes, the other woman. She's going to win. She left three days ago. End quote. 
Bly really thought she wasn't racing anyone, and, and she made it clear in one of the articles that she wrote, um, another quote, I am not racing with anyone. I would not race. If someone else wants to do the trip in less time, that is their concern. If they take it upon themselves to race against me, it is their lookout that they succeed. But I am not racing. I promise to do the trip in 75 days, and I will do it. Although I had been permitted to make the trip when I first proposed it over a year ago, I should have done it in 60 days. End quote. As a single woman traveling alone, Bly attracted a considerable amount of male attention. Despite her best efforts to look to deflect it, on the ship from Italy to Egypt, a rumor spread that she was an eccentric American heiress traveling about with a hairbrush and a bank book, and she was made an offer of marriage by a man with eyes on her. But this was uh, falsely reported, really eyes on her wealth. Another occasion, she described being called upon by a ship captain whose smooth, youthful face and tall, shapely, slender body belied her expectation as of what she thought would be a grisly old seaman. Though Jules Verne had winkingly predicted that Bly might find himself a companion along the way, as Phineas Fogg did, she was determined that hers was a voyage to be made alone. Bly's journey was populated by a real, real cast of characters whose differences, both small and large, um, she just was delighted to report on. On her very first voyage in the ocean, she took notes of an American girl who she claimed knew more about politics, art, literature, and music than any other man on board. And she chronicled all of these peculiars of any men, woman, or child that she met, um, even if it was just reaccounting a, a meal or a passing. Another who counted every step uh, she took and a woman who had once disrobed since departing from New York determined that if the ship were to sink, she would be fully dressed. All of these little nuances were something that she would put into her writings. She made the acquaintance of uh, other female travelers, including a pair of Scottish women traveling around the world as well. But over the course of two years, um, at a much more leisurely pace than she was. While some of Bly's observations about other races and ethnicities would now be seen as really offensive, she made conscious efforts to respect the cultures she encountered. She made missteps along the way, as when she inadvertently insulted Italians by offering a coin to a beggar child but spent most of her time documenting Japanese fashion, Italian cuisine, and Egyptian alligator hunting. She was treated to a ride by the finest team of ponies in Hong Kong, but was not much of a snob to see the appeal of a humble burrow named Gladstone with, quote, two beautiful black eyes, end quote. Bly dispatched what brief notes she could to the world by cable. Though she was surprised in Burndy's when the Italian-speaking cable operator asked her what country New York was in. Her more detailed handwritten reports, however, traveled by ship, as she slowly did. Her additions forced her to string out the story to maintain the public's interest. She began printing reaction pieces from foreign papers and geography lessons on all of the countries Bly was visiting. After an 8,000-mile journey across the Pacific and two weeks of silence from the woman of the moment, it was a relief to everyone when Bly arrived safely in San Francisco back on American soil. Layla, do you think um, traveling by boat, plane, or train would be the most comfortable? No, not at all. Well, you have to pick one. It's not a no, not at all. Do no. you think, which one would you rather travel by? Would you rather travel by plane? Would you rather travel by boat? Would you rather travel by car? Which one? I would travel by... Yeah. I would travel by plane. That's a great option. It's definitely when I r When she arrived in America, people were super happy 
They gave her food and hugs and cheered for her. The world, in a hurry to get their world traveler home again, chartered a one-car train to get her across the country with haste. She was greeted as a conquering heroine along the way, met at all stops by cheering crowds and well-wishers in their Sunday best. A Kansas man invited her to come to the Midwest that they might elect her governor. The mayor of Dodge City himself greeted her on behalf of its citizens. The Chicago Press Club held a breakfast in her honor, and the whole nation just continued to cheer and cry hooray for Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly arrived in Jersey City at 3.51 p.m. on January 25, 1890. Only 72 days, 6 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds after she had left. She beat her own itinerary by three days, and Vern's story by eight Elizabeth Bly Island did not arrive for four and a half days afterwards. Bly's trip was an unqualified success. But on arriving, she professed, quote, I took off my cap and wanted to yell with the crowd, not because I had gone around the world in 72 days, but because I was home again, end quote. For more insight into Nellie Bly's Around the World Adventure, her book, Around the World in 72 Days, is available and will be referenced at the end of this podcast or in the blog credits. So I want to say a special thank you for Layla for joining me today. Layla, did you have fun? Yes, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for letting me come here. You're welcome. It was great exploring uh, three different adventurers. It makes me definitely want to go on a vacation sooner than later. Hopefully summer vacation is coming up, so we'll be able to go somewhere, right, Layla? Yeah, that would be awesome. Let's go to Lava. Let's go today. Uh, Hawaii. I think, I think Layla's getting a little excited. No, I'm not. This episode is brought to you by Peppermint Bay by Layla. That's me. Get all of your bath bomb and lip balm needs on Etsy when you search for Peppermint Bay. And please join us for another exciting adventure, May 15, 2018. Also, the blog companion to this will have all the references and all the quotes as normal. So thank you, everyone, for listening to us today. Thank you for Layla joining. And I hope to see you all again. I want to say something. Uh, and definitely don't forget to check out Peppermint Bay. I am getting a new order. So see you guys on the next podcast. Adios, amigos. That was impossible to do, and I hope you guys really enjoyed that. It was really hard researching on three people, so definitely watch our first one, second one, and third one, and whatever. So, I love to sing. Ba, 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 ba. I love to sing. Ba, ba, da, bum, bum. I love to sing. Ba, ba, da, ba, da, la, la. I love to sing.